every year. There's a total disconnect now between the ruling group and the masses. I hate psychology. Clear out. They're the same worm. My characters. Analysts. Fuck you with your stupid arguments. They should not bother us. Democracy. All of this just works. Vote for the generation to recover. Holy dynamic game engine. A millennial video SES. Always support, strength. Constant freedom. And identity. I haven't you. They are a disease of our time. You're voting for what your grandfather and father fought for. I sit and you. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Longhouse, the weekly show for the sensible centrist. It's another week, another episode of The Longhouse. This time we are, well, I called the episode originally celebrating Easter, but um, uh, I don't think that quite covers it enough. So um, if you're seeing the wrong title, uh, the real title of this episode should be the Longhouse Discuss Russian Demographics, in light, of course, of the happenings that um, went down in Moscow in the week that was. With me, of course, I have Ludic Path, as always. Welcome back. Thanks for thanks for having me on again. Uh, good day, fellow patriots. Uh, you know, happy Easter and everything. So we're here to talk about the uh, coming conservative <laughs> revolution and some great news. Yes. Coming out of Russia yes, as you're, a result you're, of the you're steamrolling deck. ahead as as the West's strongest soldier, and you're you're ready to take take on Russia. At this point, no, you're I've spear, uh, I've had I've had a... Macron's <laughs> army into Russia, aren't you? I've had no, I've had a 180 uh, Sumer political conversion, so I've become uh, Russian Orthodox now, and we're going to tell oh, okay. you about Sorry, the great yeah. uh, great news coming out of the Kremlin, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're gonna pull a, a Steve Turley on us now and talk about how everything's gonna yeah, be great. I, I mean, I have you know, my... all the conservative Indians are gonna come into our country, and it's gonna be fantastic. Trump bobbleheads, the Tajiki conservative yeah, allies that we yeah. have. Uh, hello, everyone in chat. We're joining us live. It's always nice to see you. Uh, some familiar faces and some new. Uh, we're going to start this episode off as we usually do with a bit of, you know, um, something lighter uh, or something a bit different just to get sort of the blood flowing and get people uh, entering the chat. Uh, and this week we're following up on uh, something which we discussed uh, last week, which is a uh, an article uh, written by Fred Schroyen. He's a professor of social economics at the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, I believe. Uh, the title is, um, as always, unfortunately, uh, translated by Google Translate. We'll do as good as as best we can. Uh, the title is, Does Increased Life Expectancy Also Mean More Years of Good Health? Um, and the answer seems to be no, is what he's saying. So I'm just going to dive right into this. You can just... Uh, um uh, you can just uh interrupt me whenever you feel like it, Ludic Path. For every decade that passes, life expectancy increases by approximately two years and four months. We can thank both the medical and economic progress for the fact that we're getting older. Getting older, however, also means an increased incidence of chronic diseases, which can lead to a reduced functional capacity. An important question is whether increased life expectancy gives us more years of life in good health, or whether aging means that a greater proportion of life is characterized by reducing functional capacity. The answer is obviously relevant to the dim dimensioning of the care sector. Now, last week, we did talk about how a lot of Western nations are facing this sort of uh, dilemma of an you know, increasing aging population, which requires more and more intensive care while not being technically, economically able to support them in the future. So the question is that for you know the boomers, are they going to live longer? And in what state are they going to live longer whilst you know continually draining uh, society's resources? And that might expend, extend to our generation as well, like Path. Well, that's it's a very hard problem because, I mean, the question uh, usually 
you know, when journalists ask these questions, the answer is no in, in the article. And it's, con it's uh, congruent with the observations that I've had is that, okay, people have longer lifespans. Now we've reduced infant mortality. You know, you have penicillin uh, surgeries, ways to keep people alive longer, but none of this is any type of guarantee for good health. I mean, particularly, you could say that the you know reducing infant mortality is dysgenic in many ways, and many of these uh, quality of care improvements are dysgenic, meaning that okay, you can get longer lifespans, but there's absolutely no guarantee that these will be higher quality lifespans, so that the people alive will be able to be more productive. As a result, of course, it's something that you would have to to study. But I I just think you know just axiomatically, like if you keep more people alive, that would have been taken out, I guess, by some natural factors uh they are sort of on life support uh whether you like to admit that or not right so i think there's just a lot of people that are being kept uh, alive maybe like there's just some medication that might not be that expensive but it says something about like general health and the costs related to it but yeah please proceed Certainly. so he goes on to to explain something about his um method um, and, and he criticizes some of the methods of other people. So I'm just going to skip past that uh, part of the article, uh, just in the interest of time, and I'll choose to believe him. Um, chronic diseases. The good news is that there are statistical methods for me to explore the effects of such a selection, referring to his method. Uh, uh, let's see here. I have used such a method to measure the occurrence of reduced functional capacity and subsequently the life expectancy in good health for a 50-year-old man and a woman in 1985 and in 2007. During this period, life expectancy for men has increased by 4.2 years and for women by 2.5 years. Although remember that m women usually live longer. So uh, I think they're sort of decreasing or sorry, increasing slower because they're already ahead in a sense. For the same period, an increase in life expectancy and good health is estimated by 1.4 years for men and decreased by 1.6 years for women. Interesting. One explanation could be, um, this might be a quote, but we'll see. One explanation could be that when the risk of dying from serious acute diseases has, while the risk of dying from serious acute diseases has been reduced, the risk of developing chronic diseases has increased. The increase in life expectancy, therefore, does not seem to have given us as many extra good year, years of good health. One explanation could be that when the risk of dying from blah, 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 uh, is there a reason to believe that life expectancy without impairment will also develop more slowly in the period after 2007? In three years, the fifth Hunt survey will be carried out and it will undoubtedly be able to answer this question. Although it is also influenced by its selection and any calculation of life expectancy and good health should take that into account, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bit data focused, of course, this one. Um, but I think it's an interesting question to ask considering um, our previous episode. I'm not sure if you have anything else to add to this. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think it's an important thing because the you're seeing a very high increase of, of chronic diseases. So at least that's the impression that I'm getting. I don't know if this was even a thing uh, previously. There's so many of these kind of uh, medical neologisms, uh, where, like all of these psychiatric disorders, but also this concept of uh, chronic diseases or suboptimal health. I've also heard used a lot of times. Uh, I mean, usually it's like women complaining about not being able to work, you know, or not not being healthy enough to work uh, a full time job, for example, because they have some maybe a family. I don't. I, don't, I can't pronounce. All of these medical uh, terms in English, unfortunately, oh, but I'm sure you could think of um, uh, fibromyalgia or something. Yeah, is, yeah, is the, is the fibromyalgia. Yeah. yeah, I'm not yeah. sure what that means. Uh, what that is in English? Maybe it's the same thing. Um, <laughs> is that or sort of like endometriosis? Like they would have the yeah, period yeah. cramps or, or something like generally just you know women's health stuff, quote unquote that is painful uh, i mean you also have a women's rise health the... is extremely difficult compared to men's health because you know a, a woman walks into her doctor's office saying that you know her lower area hurts somewhere right somewhere below her stomach hurts and then it's just like okay well there's a list of a thousand diseases and the only way to figure out what you have is to just like eliminate everything else right <laughs> we just gotta have to start at the top of the list and just like knock off what it isn't you can't just test for one thing i think 
I've gained a lot of respect for gynecologists uh, spending more time around women. Honestly, it uh, seems it seems like a very uh, difficult field to be in. Uh, you need both creativity and ingenuity to figure out what's actually going on. Both hard and soft down skills. There. Uh, it, it, it really <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, but it's. I mean, of course, it's not just women. Like you have these, I say, these concepts like uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, for example among young people, which sure, I, sure, I don't know yeah. if, you, if you'd went back in time 100 or 200 years, if that's something they would have even talked about, uh, they, they would have had a name for it. Be, maybe somebody's just of poor health or something, or just you're weak or something. I, I assume that's how they would have labeled it. Uh, and, and that would have been or, accurate or something enough. Like, but... You know, ADHD, which which seems to be more frequent in, in the younger generation, at least the, the communications about it, right? I mean, a man born, I think even just sort of like our parents' generation, right? You're, you'll probably find a lot of men and women, but certainly men, born with ADHD who've sort of gone through life never sort of having any diagnosis or any sort of frame of reference that they have that disease or, you know, diagnosis. And they've had to just figure out ways to live their life, and they seem to be doing well on a you know society level basis, right? At, le at least I hope that's the case. It might be like sort of a, a lot of shadow okay, case, of course, cases yeah. of, of them who, who be a lot of, uh, should have had uh, help or something. But you're getting the impression that uh, at, at least that's what I believe as well. It's it's sort of better to not create an identity around well, I, the illness. Just right? in case of like something like ADHD, it's not like a new disease. It's existed for a long time, right? <laughs> yeah, it would be very strange if, if that just showed up in the last 50 years. Yeah, so, so people have managed to live with it. I'm not saying, you know, they can't benefit from help, um, but uh, it, it's an interesting sort of uh, way of thinking about it that, you know, we managed before this as well, so let's not go overboard, right? And I do remember listening to the weekly debate show last week uh, on on state channels where they covered uh, uh, they covered uh, mental health in in terms of like the the younger generations and uh, uh, the issue was basically the question is are we sort of talking our way into a bigger mental health issue on a societal level right are are we spotlighting mental health too much uh, that it's causing like a which is like a ripple effect almost and uh they had a lot of kids on from high schools uh, talking about you know stuff that they are facing and of course there's selection bias and in, in who shows up on tv but i mean the, the kids generally are not okay <laughs> the kids who showed up seem to be struggling not just in the mental health department in a lot of other departments as well and they're talking about things on tv you know how hard it is to be a high schooler and and, and when sort of pressed they're talking about things that and i'm not trying to be like oh the kids they don't know how to work but they're just describing a regular day at school, as far as I'm aware. The difference is that when I went to high school, there was like maybe one or two people in a class of 30 who had some sort of mental issue, not even necessarily full on psychosis or anything like that, but just had some sort of issue. And it seems that the kids are reporting these days that it's like half or even almost like 70% of the class, right? Are, yeah, are skipping something is not because of mental issues. Like there's just so much happening uh, all Some, the time. Something apparently. is not uh, is not right here, right? I mean, it's uh, it should be clear. I think everybody that there's an attention element of this, where you're almost incentivized to kind of make up problems there to to be kind of one of the select few or to get that special attention that these people want. And, and I mean, I, I guess that's sort of an economics way of thinking about it that you're creating an incentive. And of course, the, there are the people supplying, like generally... yeah, supplying mental illness for the demand of mentally ill. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I mean, if you've been to, let's say, like uh, uh, in like charismatic Christian communities or, or more of these kind of uh, evangelistic communities, they will have these kind of witness uh, meetings. I, I don't, not exactly sure about the uh, the English translation for this, but they will sit and and talk about their spiritual experiences and. I, I've been just being present there as a child. There's a, a lot of pressure, essentially, for people watching to just kind of make stuff up uh, in a point. I'm not trying to say this to to be a fedora tipper or just going to rebuke no, there's, Christianity. There's but a real when... social sort of 
um, uh, there's a social phenomenon of everyone is expecting someone to have a story, right? And then someone eventually will have a story. Yeah. And it doesn't I mean, really they... matter if it's true. Oh, yes. Uh, they, they will sit and tell a conversion story, and then you will get positive feedback from the community. And so I would sit and listen to some of these uh, conversion stories, and I have a very hard time believing it. Uh, I mean, it's, of course, subjective experiences. But the people who, they, they did sound like they were making it up for attention. And uh, I was sort of tempted to do that as well. Uh, so I feel like it's become kind of the same way with like medicalization that you have to parse reality in a way where you're always emphasizing the issues and the kinks and everything that doesn't work. So you could be put in the box and then get more attention, help, you know, suck something out of the... Um, the government resources. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, the, the kids probably don't think of it like that, but there is an advantage if you could be able to put yourself in the box and just get that uh, that little extra push or that that attention from from the adult. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we've been going for about fifteen minutes. I do have another article, but I think we should get on to sort of like the main event first, and we'll see if we can circle back around to. Um, to that uh, if that becomes relevant. So you've collected a bunch of articles and stats and stuff when it comes to well, Russia. Yeah, <laughs> and Russian I, I mean, I've... Um... And uh, you, you've gone on a bit of a crusade this week on Twitter against sort of uh, being, I, I guess, a lot of people being Russophilic. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm seeing it a lot, not just in our uh, circles of the internet, but as, as a sort of, this has become, I think, the norm of the broader kind of right wing. If you go outside of the center right, and it, it's not just within, like I said, our circles. I, I mean, I go on these kind of Norwegian, uh, what you'd call it, far right. We've talked about document.no and, uh, you know, reset.no, these newspapers to read about Norwegian cases, and they, they are fundamentally... Uh, you know, counter jihadi in their uh, what do you say in like their outlook and the type of things they choose to report on is very much focused on, let's say, like Muslim violence. Uh, just trying to explain my like, okay, how did I try to dig dig into this rabbit hole or whatever? But I mean, I'm seeing in the comment sections, it it seems like almost every time I read a comment section now, Russia will come up. You know, this is typical <clears throat> because they'll okay, say say like some typical case where. A, um, a a brown Muslim <clears throat> robs like a Norwegian couple, for example, uh, or something, and then they'll just go on the standard. Well, we should have never imported this crime, and it's it's the politicians' fault for for this liberal immigration policy. They're traitors, yada yada yada. And then you would typically get these th things like, uh, well, Russia doesn't allow this stuff. Like uh, Russia doesn't allow. Muslims. That's that's. Sort of, I've read this multiple times, and it becomes similar to um, <clears throat> to. I mean, the kind of like stuff that Tucker Carlson would come out with uh, when he says that uh, Russia has all this kind of, you know, great architecture. There's no soul destroying architecture in Russia, or that the, their prices for goods are cheap, or like. It's just a lot of disinfo. I can't uh, say it in another way. That just it always weaves itself into the discussion where I feel like this should be a discussion around politics in the West and how that's handled. But somehow it always comes back to well, like they, in Russia they fixed this problem, and uh, you know uh, we, all we need to do is kind of like cooperate with Russia, sympathize with Russia, and. Like I just sort of suspected, especially like with some, somebody like Tucker, you can just do a little bit of research and see that a lot of the stuff he's saying is nonsense. But I wanted to check out the idea of like, okay, there's no there's no Muslims in in Russia, or they they don't allow for uh, you know Islam in Russia or something. And of course, this was very close to like the terror attacks. So I mean, if people could put two and two together, that well, there obviously are Muslims in in. Um, in Russia, when I'm when I'm saying the terror attacks, of course, I'm referring to like the Moscow attack. So, just a sort of quick rundown, and this happened last Friday, and there was a, a massacre in the uh, Crocus City Hall, where they they were holding like a concert with the Russian rock band uh, Picnic, pronounced the uh, <laughs> uh, It's it's low key. It's like Picnic is actually kind of dope. Uh, I, I've tried to listen to some Russian rock lately, so uh, I mean it's it's a little bit hard to find because it's all written in Russian. I can't 
parse any of it. So I just have to trust the YouTube playlist. But they, they were going to do a concert there of approximately 6,000 concert goers. And then like four gunmen show up and kill. I, I think like the latest death toll that I've heard is 139 people. Uh, they, they came like with machine guns. I, people have sort of compared it to modern warfare too. I don't know if you played it, but they have that kind of like no Russian the scene airport where scene. yeah, on the yeah. airport where they just show up with machine guns and they they just uh, they they mow everybody down. So I mean, I mean, it's a very kind of serious attack. It is the kind of thing that you get maybe uh, once per decade. We've had these uh, things one, happen one in Europe moment here. Yeah. Um... Captain K in the chat says that's a lie. There's lots of Muslims in Russia. What with Chechnya and Dagestan, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure if we were misunderstood, but we were saying that there are Muslims in in Russia, uh, but but that it would seem that some people don't think there is, or they well, speak as if they aren't. Maybe I misunderstood your comment. Yeah, no, Captain that's K, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's uh, my point. Is that generally I think a lot of the. Uh, let's say like Western right wing Russia support is based on some kind of disinfo, right? I mean, like for certain groups in the dissident sphere, I would say like their Russia support is not based on this info. Uh, there's a, a growing number of uh, Russian Orthodox converts, I think, especially in the American dissident sphere. And if you're like a Russian Orthodox convert, it's not weird to support Russian foreign policy or like Eurasian expansionism or whatever. This is like the Steve Turley brand of this, where you get this kind of like, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote conservative revolution that is, I mean, it's really just kind of a cover for Russian expansion. And, that's just kind of what it is, but it's not contradictory and it's not based on a misunderstanding. The, uh, the the Russian Orthodox Church has a political element to it. They have their own pope, that's the the patriarch in Russia, who has sanctioned uh, basically Putin's foreign policy and who cooperates with Putin. And, and Putin, at least nominally, is you know like an Orthodox Christian. After this uh, attack, there there's a video of him like in one of these Orthodox churches where they're with the incense and he's kind of lighting the candles and. And every time there's sort of political stuff going on, there's always the sort of uh, talk about what the sort of orthodox faction is going to do, whether or not they're backing Putin or whatever, right? Yeah, but I mean, at least it, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, if you're like a recent Catholic convert, then uh, and the Catholic has recommendations on foreign policy, you typically don't go into Catholicism to counter signal the Pope. You know, it, it's uh, so I see that as being somewhat consistent but when there comes to like let's say like a general kind of a conservative branch of the uh of, of the dissident movement that i mean a lot of it is just based on kind of misunderstandings about russia about how they think that russia is very conservative or they think that russia is very christian or that they like they say they don't allow islam in there or they're like uh, they're all hardcore nationalist um it, it's these type of, let's say like they have like a, a martial culture sort of uh, it's very kind of masculine so they don't have uh, feminism there they have the uh, traditional family values so there, there's uh, there's some projection I going think on Russia some, is, yeah. you know demographically and geographically bigger than you know a modern culture right <laughs> uh, as a lot of people in chat are saying um, oh yeah, well it's it's absolutely the case, but uh, I mean it, it goes a lot deeper than very I... masculine Chechenians, right? But uh, you also have feminists in in the heart of Moscow, right? Well, yeah, we, maybe we should do an episode on Russian feminism. That would be uh, uh, it, it would be interesting. But I'm I'm just going to probably gonna have to censor it because they keep taking their tops off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the best kind of feminism. So, okay, I'll <laughs> I'll concede that to to the Russians that they have better, they have a much better feminist movement. Um. So, but okay, what happened is that the, the, they shot almost 140 people. They set the building on fire, and then they left in a car. Uh, and then they, they, I mean, they were stopped by, I don't know if it was Russian police or or the Russian military. Um. In, in the re region of Bryansk, Katsun. Uh, and so after that, there was a lot of messaging going out, uh, whether, you know, okay, what, what was going on there? Uh, Putin went immediately on to blame 
Ukraine. That was sort of the first speech. He he went out and said that this is uh, this is like Nazis. Basically, we're being attacked by the Nazis again, and this is Zelensky is doing this. Uh, I don't know if you can bring up some pictures of the attackers, just for reference. I can bring it up. One moment. Uh, we have a two pound um, question from Karl Habermas: Is Russia de facto segregated? Maybe that's a question for everyone here, <laughs> and not I, just I directed at us. I, I get the impression that every uh, country that is multicultural, unless there's made some kind of very concerted effort to desegregate and say like American busing or, or something like that, then these communities will naturally segregate. And it, just reading kind of, uh, I've been looking at various news videos and just reading the comments from Russians, I get the impression that, you know, there are certain areas in Russia where it's like, okay, these are like Muslim areas. And uh, say these are like maybe more like Tatar areas and, and Indians live here and, and maybe, you know, Belarusians live somewhere else. So, uh, well, here are the four attackers. Um, and as you can see, like the first thing that comes to my mind when I see these people is Ukrainian national. No, not really. I mean, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is sort of how the system works. Like it's sort of, okay, this is uh, Le 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 Zelensky. Nazis that have sent these people they in to attack. On. I a, mean, they uh, Russian to me, Yeah, yeah they've, they've been very well integrated. <laughs> the the track suits and, and cigarettes, and they're beaten up. So, I, I bought it. These uh, these uh, these are the new these are the new Russians. Um, I, I I mean the the problem is that, of course, the region of Bryansk borders on Ukraine. Uh, the thing is that it also borders on Belarus. So there was sort of conflicting messaging. The uh, Alex uh, Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, basically said that he he thought that they were going there to escape. So the, I mean, this seems to be a kind of trivial thing, but it isn't because there's been so much speculation about this attack in terms of, uh, uh, you know, where they were going, right? Because people take this as hard evidence that either these are like, uh, Ukrainians, meaning that they uh, were somehow directed by the Ukrainian military, meaning uh, British intelligence, Americans meaning British, American yeah. intelligence, uh, eventually the CIA. I, I mean, if you go on a comment section for any any news article or any any Twitter thread about this, then it's it's kind of just kind of like CIA, CIA, CIA um, all over. And and I guess one of the pieces of evidence, quote unquote, is that they were trying to go to Ukraine, which is not really conclusive. Um, so yeah, okay, step one, uh, the, the blame is put on Ukraine. And, and that's what Putin goes out and says that, well, this is Ukraine. And now we're going to escalate the war, they bomb uh, Ukrainian cities. Later that day, uh, a branch of ISIS, basically ISIS K comes out and says that they take responsibility for the attack. Uh, aside, I mean, this is, of course, something that ISIS usually does. So you can't take them at their word directly. I mean, I think even after the attack yeah, in Oslo, yeah. like the single gunman, the ISIS came they out did, and yeah. claimed responsibility. So this is very typical. But uh, if, if there is a sort of evidence that they were involved, it is that the fact that they had video footage of these attacks that were uploaded to ISIS websites. Uh, so these guys had GoPros inside of the uh, the concert hall where they filmed themselves during this attack. And it was very sort of instantly uploaded onto these websites. Um, I mean, looking at these guys, they're all Tajiki uh, immigrants, right? Which is something I, I didn't even know that Tajikistan was a thing until I uh, looked this stuff up. But it is like a landlocked country, uh, sort of, I think, under Kazakhstan, close to Afghanistan. About 10 million uh, people live there. They're dirt poor. Uh, they look like this. And they're all, I say, like 98% Sunni Muslim. Which is the same, like, right. uh, I mean, ISIS is a sort of Sunni organization. I also didn't know that uh, before. Uh, you know, I guess I I've had a lot of general ignorance on uh, foreign policy and these types of issues, but uh, ISIS is at least officially a sort of Sunni organization. So it, it, it's something that does uh, check out. And if it borders on Afghanistan, that's apparently where these, uh, the ISIS-K branch, the ISIS Khorasan, is located. So at least it leads some credibility to the idea that uh, they're affiliated with that. Uh, I mean, when it comes to the sort of CIA claim, uh, I mean, it, it's sometimes a little bit confusing for me because, okay, uh, if the, the CIA people mean that the CIA directly asked these people to attack uh, this particular location or that the CIA is involved because they financed ISIS, 
which they have done in the past. But uh, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear on it, particularly from, let's say, like an American perspective, if uh, they think that this uh, Crocus City Hall Theater is a sort of strategic high value target from, let's say, like the perspective of winning the Ukraine war, because uh, I mean, civilians are not high value targets. Uh, typically, you go after infrastructure or policy makers. Um, say somebody I mean, who actually uh, has a say in has Russian been government. A lot of reports going about, you know, uh, Ukrainian intelligence, aka British, aka whatever, right? Uh, doing a lot of stuff against like Russian, what is it, gas, uh, gasoline pipelines, right? Stopping. Yeah a lot of infrastructure in that sense, like that, stopping that, Russia from being able to do war, right? But, but that is different. That is like actually strategic Yeah, but that's damage, what I'm saying. Like, right? uh, that's and different, right? Because the, 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 uh, when, you, when you kill civilians like this, the, the effect that you get is really that you can be able to escalate, um, yeah, yeah. just escalate the conflict, which they have done. I mean, they've sort of officially come out and said that we're, not, we're no longer doing the, the uh, special ops thing in Ukraine war now, now it's an actual yeah. war I mean I've got, nobody <laughs> believes that it's a sort of special ops uh, that's been going for two years this is an all-out war the at this point poster that posts like day 407 of the special operation the, the, with the, the monkey and man. the image of Putin yeah. just becoming more and more hollowed <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's see here so the, I mean there are some interesting details about this right when it comes to speculating around the conspiracy uh u.s security services apparently warned american citizens as well as the uh, russian government two weeks ahead of this attack that there was likely to be islamic terrorism in here uh, i mean if you look at accounts say like uh, haas uh, infrared haas he just went immediately to that line that okay this means that the u.s is responsible i i'm also not able to pull those two things together uh I don't know why you warn people about Islamic terrorism if you're supposed to make an Islamic terrorist up. Or uh, uh, maybe it's a priming thing, right? Yeah, it, it could be. But of course, uh, Putin dismissed these things. He, he went out and basically said that this is a form of blackmail uh, of Russia, even though there are reports that the kind of the Russian security service had uh, found the neutralized terrorist cells previously in March that we're trying to target Russian synagogues, right? So uh, <laughs> it seems like uh, Russia is more on point with protecting the um, chosen people than actual kind of ethnic Russian Tartars. At least that's what I'm getting from uh, from this stuff, because there was, I mean, if there's one thing to say about it, this was a sort of security failure on Russia's part, because uh, the Russian security police, they, they took over an hour to arrive at the concert scene, which is something that, I mean, it would have seemed plausible if this wasn't like central in Moscow, that is the capital of Russia. It, it's it's like you had a concert in uh, Oslo Spectrum or something, and the police would have taken one hour to arrive. It's uh, <laughs> it's not great. These, these people should not have been able to get away in a car and, and drive as yeah. far as they did. I, I'm not I'm not sure how this even works, especially if they have intel and they've been warned previously and they, like they're not able to provide uh, you know enough protection for people to be uh, let's say like to, to uh, neutralize these situations uh, i mean with um the the 22nd of july attacks with Anders Bering Breivik in Norway they, they took a long time to get to him because he was on an island right uh, yeah you could at least make the argument that it's a bit out of the way right so, the, so it was sort of difficult logistically to, and, to get there and but, um, you know the sort of the uh the distraction worked in terms of the bombing of of the government buildings, right? Which was yep, exactly. the uh, original idea, right? You distract all the police people by all, all the sort of. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm blanking. Well, yeah, you distract the police by setting up bombs in the middle of Oslo, so they'll not be looking at that small island out in the middle of nowhere, basically. Yep. And, so uh, you know, they should be criticized for being fooled by it, obviously, especially when they knew that he had, you know, bombing equipment, et cetera, et cetera, and been keeping tabs on them for months. This anyway. is the typical. <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. a typical security line, right? We were keep we keep tab tabs on the situation, and they're they're apparently always monitoring, but it doesn't always translate. It was into a known entity, yeah. <laughs> anything else? Uh, but yeah, the um, they were eventually captured. 
uh, like I said, ISIS took responsibility. Uh, you know, Putin first blamed Ukraine, then then later he sort of come out and said that well, actually it was. Uh, he believes that it was done by Islamic uh, terrorists. Uh, they use this sort of term Salafists as well, which is a sort of thing in, oh, in uh, Russia. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but he believes that somebody else ordered the attack. So you leave the um, you kind of leave the door open for maybe uh, foreign intelligence to have interfered. So uh, the attackers claim that they were paid about 500,000 rubles to do this, which uh, I don't have a currency calculator. What's the, what's the ruble right now? Does anybody Let know? Let me find out. Yeah, so, that's 500,000. That's about 50. Well, that's about $5,000. That's not a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, um, <laughs> but it, I mean, Tajikistan is like, poor you know that's is there one of the yeah, things that i've read looking at yeah. this like these you, you talk about like russia in general is is a poorer country than most of the western developed countries and within russia like the, particularly these muslim areas and like the, the muslim muslim countries on the periphery of russia they're just like dirt, dirt is, poor, like, you know yeah would you let some russian guy um you know in in an experimental operation really suntan your balls for for five thousand <laughs> usd <laughs> i would need to be uh, a little bit more desperate uh i i yeah. guess um i'm sure if you go to like the netherlands you can get it cheaper or germany i, I you can get so someone too. to to tase your balls <laughs> the uh Oof. so so yeah not a lot of money for that what happened after they were captured and they've been interrogated is that you have the, um, the the torture, which is a sort of thing that I actually wanted to look at a little bit closer because I was kind of surprised by the reactions. Putin came out and said that he's sort of suspending their human rights or whatever. I don't know what that even means. Uh, like they even respect that stuff in Russia or they they even have some sort of due process, but they were basically given over to security forces, tortured, and then images and films of that torture was leaked out on social media. Which, I, I mean, they, they apparently they got a lot of praise for it. I don't know if you have any photos from um, from the torture, but we're talking about like very quite brutal things, uh, you know, bordering on the grotesque. Say, like one guy had his ear cut off, and he was sort of forced to eat. His his air. Uh, the other guy had like a car battery uh, strapped to his balls. They did like you could see they did uh, like plastic bag suffocation, like the sort of the, if you played Manhunt or something on the uh, PlayStation Two. It's very grim stuff. Like they they brought them into they brought them into the court, uh, basically like beaten up with the plastic bag still hanging around their heads. Uh, uh, that was the photo I showed earlier. Yeah, they were pretty yeah. beat up. Maybe I mean if you go to go back to the photo right because I ran a I ran a poll on my Twitter asking what people thought about like public torture if they thought it's uh, is this like a masculine trad based thing or is this just a kind of gay Jewish neurotic thing and uh, like the the overwhelming majority seem to be quite uh, happy with public torture in in this sense maybe you could take a look well, at the uh, the Twitter we can do that but. Um... Before we get into it, I think I'll, I'll um, uh, because uh, Captain K here sent me a post from Twitter, so maybe I can can play devil's advocate for a moment here. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, show um, a tweet from Russians with attitude um, to maybe shine some light on the sort of why it's happening the way it's happening. Several photos and videos of the Crocus terrorists being brutalized have been leaked. I'll try to explain why this is being done, in my opinion. Firstly, it is simply part of the social contract of the Putin era that terrorists are outside of the law. Quote, we'll kill them wherever we find them. If it's in the outhouse, we'll whack them in the outhouse. It's one of the most famous expressions ever uttered by Putin in reference to Islamist terrorists. The modern Russian approach to the problem of terrorism is a tightly controlled state of exception in which none of the bureaucracy and legalism that are so characteristic of modern Russia are applied. They simply just get killed. Well, that wasn't the case here, though, but fair enough. The ones who don't get killed are either irrelevant or have information that needs to be extracted from them, again, without the application of any laws or rules. 
terrorist has placed himself outside of the civilized society, so he doesn't get to enjoy its protections. You can agree or disagree or think it's barbaric, but this is simply the framework under which the Russian Federation handles the problem of terrorism. Secondly, the minute it became known that the perpetrators were Tajiks, a circus kicked off among Russian media and politics to repeat the tired phrase that, quote, terrorism has no ethnicity, etc. Westerners are intimately familiar with this. Quote, what about the backlash? And so on. While causing an inter-ethnic strife is indeed an objective of the enemy, this really pisses people off. These terrorists do have an ethnicity, and none of them should have been in the country in the first place. Thus, publicly brutalizing these animals is a gesture towards ordinary Russians, promising that while everyone keeps talking about how Tajiks are the nicest people ever, and how some Muslim teenagers saved hundreds of lives during the attack and whatnot, the display of, quote, tolerance and, quote, multiculturalism that has been deemed necessary to keep ethnic strife at bay will not be applied to the perpetrators. One ear posted on the internet may have saved a thousand ears in real life. Again, I'm not approving or disapproving, just try describing the mechanisms as I understand them. So I guess this that's an, a pro-Russian sort of way to explain what is going on here. No, it's a very good post. I don't doubt this at all, that this is a part of like uh, an appeasement strategy. The, the Sorry, from, from, uh, from, from Putin. Yeah, especially if, uh, I mean, if there was a security failure, ideally you would have been able to stop the attack. Uh of course but uh if you aren't then and people are angry and i mean we'll get into this later but the immigration into russia is not popular like among uh and this is one of the problems for putin as well and one of the things that he's tried to crack down on is really like kind of like russian ethnic nationalist sentiment which is something that uh, here's here's the thing that we think that you know we're in the west and like they have this kind of controlled responses to the terror attacks uh but it's kind of the same thing the, the thing is that okay you're getting the uh you're getting the air cuts off and and this kind of stuff but it's still okay we're still going to continue with the immigration and the underlying causes for why this is happening it's not going to change but you get to see a guy uh, hooked up to hooked up with his balls to um a car battery we're doing cock and ball torture basically publicly to to appease the masses and and i mean yeah there we have the poll here, like the reason I, I put, um, I, I contrasted like masculine and trad and Jewish and gay from these is, is that it made me think back to, like, I keep going back to this sort of 2000s media stuff and where everything went wrong, uh, where we've talked enough about the man show and uh, postal and some of these things. But another one of these tasteless features of the 2000s was the, um, the torture porn genre. And I don't know if we covered that a lot, but then you have like these. Mm. Uh, Jewish directors, uh, say like Eli Roth, for example, who made movies like Hostel. I mean, of course, that should have been kind of an episode on, in, onto itself because, uh, like, with cultural memory, the the Hostel movie, like at least the first one, is a lot less graphic than people remember it being. It was just the time that it came out at and the way that it was presented that made it very, shall we say, uh, it had a very strong effect on the public. And I watched it too, and and. But it sort of kicked off a genre of movies where you would display like very graphic torture. And like this comes along with others, say like these kind of crime shows, let's say like Dexter, for example, that I felt like I always had a uh, distaste for it, even at the time where it, it's, I'm not, mm. just to, to preface this, I'm yeah. not uh, against uh, the death penalty. I'm not against capital punishment. Yeah, I, I think I was going to say, uh, because I've, I've, I press show results, which I usually do on your polls because I don't want to skew the numbers, right? Um, but I was going to ask you whether or not um, I'm reading too much into it because I would certainly argue that culturally and whatever, there's there's room for public punishment in in Western society, right? And, and there has I would not. Yeah, I would not be against this either. Like, I'm not against the death penalty. I'm not even against corporal punishment as seen in, say, in places like um, Singapore, for example, where I think it's been absolutely necessary as a way to discipline people. And it, and also from like an economic perspective, I see it as being more effective with people's resources than you, you say you're wasting... Spe you're specifically talking yeah. about torture. I'm, yeah, specifically talking about torture here, because that's what this is. Um, it's not... This was not a clean execution. Uh, I, I was watching like a, a BBC report after the Moscow attacks, and that's what the um, 
that's what i mean one of the men they interviewed he came with the sort of standard line that you usually hear if you ask a man after something like this and i i, I said this after like the brevik attacks and i heard many people in oh Norway yeah as well. i would have been should... totally okay yeah. if you know he just happened to be dead by the time they found him right we we should have <laughs> we should consider reinstating uh capital punishment uh, for this this case right and um i realized that russia actually doesn't have the death penalty it was sort of suspended uh under a, mem was a, a moratorium under boris yeltsin actually so i i thought that this is another thing sort of to dispel you'd sort of imagine that uh russia has the death penalty but i mean they just circumvent that by just not giving a shit about due process but like within the due process that they do have that is sort of uh i get the impression that they're really trying to imitate the sort of western liberal institutions but they really don't have the temperament or the goodwill or sort of any actual interest in maintaining these institutions uh, or attempting to maintain they, them as they neutral, have the so. bureaucracy but no interest yeah. in using it whenever you know no, it, it just gets, uh, you know, you just have uh, executive power that just gets used and they, it just goes around it. And if they want somebody dead, they're just dead. So it doesn't really mean that much. But they have the veneer of these Western institutions, just like the um, the elections, for example, that Putin wins every time or or like this, like you're rolling guys with uh, who recently been tortured into a courthouse, which is supposed to look like they're going to have a trial. But it's kind of pointless if their rights have been suspended already. So yeah, at that point, why not? I mean, of course, sure, maybe they want information from them, but why not just kill them? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, they sense the same message, right? And there are, of course, enhanced interrogation methods that uh, are, I guess, simpler and more effective than cutting off their ears and forcing them to eat it or something like that. I, uh, I, I don't think that you're getting what you want out of that from just like an efficiency perspective. Um, but i mean there, there is something to this kind of i understand like if it was only russians responding to this poll i would i would understand the results because i think russian tradition and russian culture has a legacy of brutality whether you look at like the the soviet era or the, the previous eras before that uh, i mean I, I was watching a series of about geopolitics from alexander stubb who's the prime minister of finland currently and he talked about that he believes that this is from the uh, the um russian uh mongolian heritage basically that's what uh um, th that's where this comes from so i think like mongols and arabs in particular that have this uh tradition of um uh, of, of particular brutality that i find distasteful and i think it's sort of safe to say that on a civilizational level it's uh frowned upon uh, in in the west but seeing like these results it just made me think that you know, if, uh, if if that's where people stand, I mean, a lot of this just a lot of the people in our spheres, it just comes down to bloodlust for them, honestly, uh, that I've just kind of misread. I, I don't want to read too much into this, but you know, kind of it's a bit of a misreading to say that uh, a lot of people, they just got kind of, they we're just colorblind and we just want colorblind populism and we're like the real liberals or something. I, I oh, think there is a much. Uh, <laughs> but George Bush yeah. told me we won the war on terror. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. But I mean, I wrote further down in that thread that I think a lot of the dissident right are just kind of secretly spiritual Arabs that, uh, you know, you, you see these people tweeting like, well, I don't want the Star Trek future. I want the Dune future. So their kind of dream scenario is to live in the desert and um, marry their cousin and just like spend their mm. life fighting a family <laughs> feud that's been lasting for 2000 years or something i mean it's, it sounds like i'm exaggerating but i'm getting the impression just from the uh, just looking at the, like some of these polls just, and the, the, the stuff that people are posting that they just kind of yearn for this why, ultra... why do you want june when you can have hyperborea i mean that's it's it still <laughs> has spaceships we can go back to the planet we came from ledic but do we have public torture in hyperborea i'm not sure no just trial um, by combat it's honorable yeah right but it's horrible um, bro well i mean even that would have been would have been preferable <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. i think to... i mean public sort of uh, at least you know thinking about my own culture uh we certainly do have history in the west for public punishment and capital punishment right public executions etc it's the torture part that's different right i'm not saying we haven't done it i'm just it's, it's Look, not as pervasive it seems 
looking far enough back into history, especially in the medieval era, and uh, I mean, you're seeing this stuff, uh, and a lot of times this sure. is to demonstrate yeah. political power very cleanly, like yeah. say some stuff like quartering or something. I mean, it, it's it is been very quite a while to, since uh, that. That's my point. And it was also extremely rare at the time, right? I think with uh, was it Robespierre or something? A lot of the it stirred up a lot of anger just because he was tortured so badly, like uh, before the French Revolution. So people had a very negative reaction to to these things when they happen. It's not something that people are, you know, generally happy to see uh, elongated torture sessions of uh, of people. Uh, at least that's the impression I, I get. Uh, and I don't and it's, think it's, it's really... You know, it's fine. You know, Russia is different. And that's what we've been trying to communicate for a long time. Russia is very different. Yeah, it, it, it certainly is. But uh, maybe not like, maybe not in these spheres, you know, because there's uh, more yeah. kind of like spiritual, spiritual Russians that are here. But um, yeah, I mean, I think... The eagle Viking <laughs> thing. Sure, yeah, a thousand years ago. Fine. Um... I, I don't know how pervasive that was either, to be honest. Uh, it's hard to know, right? It's hard yeah. to know with the... We don't really have a lot of sources for that, I think, other nope. than that it happened. Uh, we but, have a £5 uh, donation from Karl Habermas here, who says, if I lost a fight in the Colosseum, I pray Emperor, uh, the Emperor watching is Ludic. <laughs> <laughs> what, because he would grant you a clean death? Is that it? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a thumbs up anyway, Karl. But... Um... <laughs> Tim Miller oh, that, that, asks, that sounds great. Do Norwegian people talk about Russia often? Here in America, no normal people care about Russia. Well, I mean, Russia is a natural part of, you know, our geopolitics. So it's it's a part of the foreign news columns uh, as much as most European countries, right? Well, I mean, we border on Russia, right? It's uh, not yeah, exactly. a big border. We're not one of like the main countries that it's easy for Russia to get into, but it is a neighbor, and it's been, it's always been a geopolitical concern in Norway ever since, uh, say, like after the Second World War. If you're going to either, you're going to have to be a junior partner to the Soviet bloc or to Russia, or you're going to have to be a junior partner to the the USA, right? So that's part of the and with the Ukraine war as well that it does come up quite a lot where they talk about norwegian russians for example and their uh attitudes in in norway so i i mean as as far as people who are interested in discussing politics i think uh, russia does come up but uh, generally i'm experiencing a sort of fatigue around it like with people who I'm, I'm just like having casual conversations with they seem very resistant to want to talk about any political topic at this point i don't know if you have a similar experience maybe but, but I wanted to just kind of get back on track here because there is a question now with okay the, the Russian Muslim problem. Trying to diagnose it. So maybe you could find this sort of chart uh, sure. that I put out, this kind of like percentage. Um, one of, moment uh, here. I'll bring up one more super chat here. Read Spengler on Russia, says Pergrin Stefanger. I will do that. I think it's called Spengler on the Soul of Russia or something like that. Um, let's see here. You wanted the total national and international migration. Is that no, one? no, just the one that like the percentage of Muslims uh, in in the country. Oh, the, yeah, like I'll bring if that you up. have it. Yep. No, I have it. Just to give a general outline, because the I mean, it's not easy to get accurate data with when it comes to the Russian population. It's a little bit all over the place, it seems. But general estimates. Will say that it's like between say between ten and twenty percent of the Russian population are Muslim. It's, uh, I mean, some people say it's uh, you know they fifteen is a number that I hear thrown around, and they expect that just based on birth rates and immigration that it's going to go up to twenty percent within uh, twenty thirty, which sounds like a long time, but it's it's only about five years away from us. So I mean, that's where they are, and just sort of compare. I mean, you have uh, countries where they complain about you know. Uh, Muslims like um, Sweden, for example, that's been the, the sort of standard. Uh, they talk about you know being colonized by Muslims or the the caliphate or whatever. Like you always hear these kind of news stories about um, the the Swedish Muslim problem, but they are somewhere between uh, you know five and ten percent. I mean that may even be too much. If we have Leo Borealis in the chat, maybe he could um, give us a more accurate statistic on it but like the actual percentage of muslims living in sweden is uh 
not as big as the amount of problems that they're causing, say, compared to their actual size of the population. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I posted a meme with this stuff on... The uh, per capita on, remains undefeated. Right? Yeah, I, I posted a meme about this on uh, on Twitter, and you get the, the kind of like standard response here that actually, well, you see that these are just kind of native Muslims that have always been in Russia, right? So, so there's not been any changes because of immigration or, or anything like it has in Europe, uh, which is also something that we're going to have to look into because it's wrong. Uh, just kind of straight up um, not correct. There, there's been a lot of immigration into Russia, uh, especially like f from the 90s and up, particularly from the 2000s, from these kind of Central Asian regions. And I, I'm, I'm not sure where we want to start with this. Do you want to take a look at the, the Russian demographics article uh, just to outline a little bit of the, the general sure. situation? Uh, which one of them? <laughs> I think it's the, the the top the top link here uh, from the things that I've posted. Uh, the migrants welcome. Is that it? Yeah. Let's let's start there. Yep. Uh, real quick here, we have a chat from Wow Wow. He says it's pretty gay if you're squirming watching a guy who killed almost a hundred people having zero cut off. We're not squirmy about the video. Uh, we're uh, saying that the act of public torture is not necessarily something that meshes well with our cultures and trying to say that everyone should be like russia is stupid well i mean i, I can give a sort of, it into a sentence but yeah. well, like i could give a take on that because this is kind of the um the uh, uh the sort of more simplified version of the kind of pete kionis uh, argument that he put up and i i mean you try to avoid the punching right or whatever this thing but like the um the tweet series went something like one guy tweets, here's the guy getting his ear cut off and blah, blah, blah. And this isn't like, this is something barbaric that's not belong in our civilization. And then Pete responds with something like, well, you're so feminized that you, you think that the, you know, uh, th that this punishment is very small compared to, compared to the crime and so on. But like, I mean, there's sort of more layers to this than like, you, you're just feminine and gay if you don't like torture. I mean, one of the angles to this is really the kind of lack of any, due process into this stuff which is sort of is this kind of a masculine response is kind of the first question uh, and my impression is that it really isn't like the masculine response is a sort of rule-based approach uh then this is what you get typically when you talk to women and men around these situations uh, let's say like you, you take a, a situation like Anders Bering Breivik for example and you ask women you know what should happen to him uh, and they will give you some answer like, well, he should be uh, have like a hot poker put in his anus and have his uh, balls chopped off and put his <laughs> mouth. And like, if you say if you only even talk about someone who has uh, shot a child or something, they will sit and, and endlessly rave around about this kind of true crime styled, elaborate uh, torture methods that they want done to this particular individual for having harmed a child. Whereas the the what I see as really the masculine instinct is that you have a certain certain rules that just needs to be followed. Uh, so, so for me, it's it's sort of... Okay. Well, I, I would have think because I feel like, I mean, Nordano said this to me, right? It doesn't mesh well with our culture. It doesn't mesh well with our modern liberal sensibilities because, I mean, my first instinct there is just to kill them. Which it doesn't have to be uh, torture. I mean, that that is a lot cleaner, right? I mean, you get the, the thing with the taste for brutality and the distaste for brutality. I don't, you know, I, I like to eat meat. But I don't like to torture animals. Does that make sense? I think that's a sort of, uh, okay. a sort yeah, of question about, going. let's yeah. say, like dignity, for example. Uh, whereas yeah. you have like the Arabs who do this kind of hal halal slaughter thing where they just like oh, yeah, the yeah, animal yeah, hang okay. upside I see, down. I see and, where you're and, going with this. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so that's that's one of the uh, one of the angles to to this. Um, maybe I lost my train of thought. I'm not even sure. I, I the point isn't like okay, you, you're being squeamish here, but th there's a sort of there's a lot of problems. I think sort of civilizationally, culturally, if you're getting to the point that uh, okay, some some crime has been committed, some murder has happened, and what we're going to do now is to enjoy the show of like some kind of like brutal torture show instead of trying to uphold a, a sort of institutional thing. Did you see what I mean? And yeah, the sort of the, you know, the the sort of systematic mind that yeah. sort of led to the modern quote unquote liberal democracy that has all of these and, structures, is the same mind that you know would 
would would build this yeah i see where you're going with it and the, the thing is also you could talk about like okay is the natural human liberal or illiberal my view is that like the the european man is, is has more kind of like natural inbuilt liberal impulses than say the russian man uh and and you don't have to think about liberalism in terms of like uh okay there's like pride parades and all these kind of other <laughs> negative connotations but imagine like okay having an institution that is supposed to serve people in your society and working to have that institution remain neutral for example is a liberal impulse i'm yeah, i'm yeah, watching I i'm watching babylon 5 currently it's a sort of sci-fi show right about the uh, kind of space station that they put up to be a sort of peacekeeping station between aliens and they follow this uh like kind of ex uh, army general who tries to just sort of maintain the station and he goes to very great lengths to maintain political neutrality even at the cost of life in this station even though it, it he gets into situations where it would have been tempting to okay we can just kill this guy or we can just torture this person but if if you do that you sort of you, you the entire veneer of any kind of neutrality in this system is broken and of course you could go through these kind of uh aaron mcintyre-esque uh, catholic arguments that the institutions can never be neutral and, and right. I, I get it but i think it's sort of it's very laudable for people who are actually trying to work in an institution and try to have it be neutral instead of people i, I don't want to derail all of this yeah. because you're, you're going back to like i mean can any institution ever be neutral right <laughs> The question is, I mean, are you trying to make the institution function in a neutral way, or are you just using the institution as an instrument for your own personal mm. uh, revenge fantasies? In a sense, it's it's similar to, I, I talked about this kind of Twitter, I think it was a sort of Reddit thread or something in, in one of these Manosphere uh, spaces where, you know, they posted some woman who said that she'd gone to confession in a Catholic church. And talked about cheating on her husband and then the the priest had gone and told on uh her husband so their marriage had been broken up uh ended in divorce and of course this is sort of an example of what i'm talking about here is that the the priest basically kind of used his position i mean he's already taken a vow to not uh to, yeah. uh, to be secretive about the confession but he broke that vow so he could to take personal revenge on this woman in this particular situation the result now is that you don't have this institution anymore like nobody is eventually going to use this kind of confessional system because, because they, they trust know it. that the person behind is just going to use it for personal gain right and then you have you go from having a high trust society to basically a low trust society right um yeah. nordana says he isn't supposed to do that thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's the point. That is the kind of neutrality. Bit. Like, wh what if, uh, let's say, like, it's these kind of Tajiki people, right, who go into confession. Like, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, Father, I've killed 139 people. Well, do you get to uh, break the confession then? Right? You, that's where you're seeing these kind of issues. Is, is that I'm just well, saying, Lord I think Anand, it's laudable uh, to try. Lord Anand said earlier, he said, I saw a tweet once of a German executioner's sword with the words, when I swing the sword, I hope for the salvation of this poor sinner, or something like that. That seems like the proper Western mentality, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to dwell on this point too much, but we should look at the so Russian demographics. Hypothetically, uh, just, just for my own edification, I guess, <laughs> hypothetically, uh, would the right course of action, if you're sort of ruler of Russia in the sense, um, would it be, you know, send these guys through the courts and have sort of the bureaucracy do its thing or is it to i mean that's one uh, option b is the torture stuff that they're doing now option c something like kill them and you know deport every muslim from moscow well option c seems pretty nice but it, it does go against um the, the the ideas that i've been trying to talk about ideally I, you yeah that's have that's what i'm that's what i'm thinking because that goes against the things you're talking about right? yeah and, and the, the, the institution sort of is no longer neutral different issue then I, I would ideally i would have had them have the death penalty it, it, i mean it's, it seems pretty clear there's no kind of getting around this sure. if you have a, a clear criteria and they like they posted the evidence the evidence is on uh, is posted online so it's pretty clear that they're guilty it should be a very cut and dried case and it would end in a hanging or something and uh that would be that it's something that would have been a lot more clean and, and it could have um 
let's say it's like satisfied the public need for retribution to a certain sense while maintaining uh, at least a, an attempt at neutrality. All right, let's move on. I don't want to get bogged down with with this. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is an article called Migrants Welcome. Is Russia trying to solve its demographic crisis by attracting foreigners? By Kristina Fultinova. Uh, 161,170. That's how many passports Russian authorities issued to foreigners between January and March this year. It's more than twice the number that the country issued during the same period in 2019. In April 2020, President Vladimir Putin also signed a dual citizenship law that estimates suggest will attract up to 10 million new citizens. Why? Putin has made reversing Russia's demographic crisis a major priority. Russia's population declined for more than a decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. This trend was reversed in 2009, but the population started falling again in 2018, and future prognoses are not optimistic. Why is Russia's population declining? 2018, Russian, Russia's fertility rate was 157. Is that the same as us? Uh, yeah, right now we're at, I think we're yeah. at one, we're approaching one four now, but this yeah. is uh, 2024. Like, the, ah, okay. They're a little bit ahead of us, I think, in, sure. in the decline. That rate was compared, oh, <laughs> even says it, uh, comparable to European countries such as Germany or Norway and higher than some nations. In South Korea, for example, the rate was 0 0.98. I mean, we've talked about South Korea before. We should do a South Korea episode at some point. <laughs> we got to figure Russia out what's going on over there. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a little bit too crazy, in my opinion. It's going a bit too fast. <laughs> Uh, Russia was among 40 countries with the lowest fertility rates in the world in 2018. It also fell far short of replacement fertility rate, which is, which is roughly 2.1 and represents the average number of children born per woman at which population exactly replaces itself from one generation to the next without any migration. Uh, so here we have fertility rates, and the biggest one is Kazakhstan. Um, and there's France, Germany, Russia. Yep. Uh, situation is not identical across Russia. In 2019, several regions with a large portion of ethnic minorities and a lower share of ethnic Russians, such as Taiva and Chechnya, had higher fertility rates, and in some cases above the replacement fertility rate. Russia also has one of the highest death rates in the world, ranking 7th according to 2020 CIA estimates. A study by the Lancet 2014... Because the CIA killed all of them. That's um, how they know. <laughs> That's how they know. <laughs> by The Lancet in 2014, indicated that the probability of a Russian man dying before he turns 55 is 25%. That's insane. In 2018, every fourth death in Russia is occurred, occurred before the age of 60. Factors include poor medical care and nutrition, as well as lack of exercise and high incidence, particularly among men, of deaths due to alcohol and tobacco abuse, unintentional poisoning, and suicide. That sounds very Russian. Uh... Another major factor in Russia's demographic calculations is migration, both in the, into the country and out of it. 2018, more than 90,000 Russians were granted citizenship or a residency permit in an EU country, included, including the United Kingdom. Also, the share of people aged 18 to 24 who want to leave Russia increased from 29% in 2009 to 53 in 2019. What has Russia been doing to stop this trend? Russia has been trying to boost its fertility rates and reduce death rates for several years now. Special programs for families have been implemented, anti-tobacco campaigns have been organized, and raising the legal age to buy alcohol has been considered. However, perhaps the most successful strategy so far, far has been attracting migrants whose arrival helps Russia to compensate population losses. In fact, with more than 11 million foreign-born migrants as of 2019, Russia is the second most immigrated to country in the world after the United States. Very interesting. Oh, uh oh, oh, I mean, this is again. We're getting back to the sort of fact checking bit here because uh, the the um, at least the impression that I'm getting when I read all these sort of comment sections with the the Russo files is that they're not quite aware of this. You know, there's a little factoid that they're uh, they have like the highest immigration rate next to the U.S., which is um, I mean, it's it's pretty rough. They they will sit and complain about you know how bad it is for yeah. Say we bring Sweden again, for example, and uh, seems to be a majority Ukrainians though, and this is 2019. Remember, 
Yeah, they're probably going out now. But I mean, we can, we can yeah. take a closer deep dive into where they're but coming. But still, from of course, it's a lot of Tajikistan and uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. In 2018, however, migration didn't compensate for the losses, and Russia's population fell for the first time in 10 years. <laughs> Putin, no. <laughs> The downward trend continued in 2019. This trend may have been a factor in the decision to ease citizenship loss. In 2019, Ukrainians accounted for more than 60% of people getting Russian citizenship. In April and July of that year, Putin signed decrees making it easier for people in Ukraine's Donetsk and Luhansk regions, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's it's probably because he fast-tracked them, right? That's why maybe 2019 is an anomaly. Yeah, right. it, it is, and they've been, you know, leaving. Uh, they're not staying there now, right? And obviously, so... they're not staying there now, right? In April 2020, Putin signed a law allowing dual citizenship for foreigners in hopes to attracting up to 10 million migrants, mostly from countries with sizable Russian-speaking populations. So they're mostly targeting neighboring nations, right? Yes, uh, especially like their neighbors to, uh, let's say, like the this, this, uh, Central East Eastern Asia. Yeah. Uh, location right that, that it's borat country basically that's uh the, the kind of people that they're bringing in <laughs> yeah the stans and yeah it, it but yeah most of them are muslims to a very high degree and they're you know darker browner in their complexion uh and, yeah but the fertility rate of course and you have like very uh very high poverty and they're all uh, religious traditionalists uh it's it's a lot higher so there's a lot to take from but it leads to issues like similarly to let's say the united states who gets them from mexico or or whether whether you i mean you're getting in basically muslim radicals so at least a certain portion of them who come from that kind of area are going to cause trouble they just are uh knowing what's happened in europe with even smaller uh population sizes uh, i mean imagine you're getting that just even more of it right Let's see here. Is there anything more? Uh, according to the most pessimistic scenarios, Russia's, Russia estimates that its population might drop by 12 million in the next 15 years. And even the most optimistic forecasts say that the death rates will still exceed birth rates in 2035, although the gap might narrow significantly. Russia may depend on migrants to cover population losses no matter which scenario comes into play. And I mean, you're talking about the great replacement, right? Because this is uh, what, what people are talking about, that this, uh, you know, the fertility rates and the incentives, uh, the birth rates among the natives and so on. But it's really the same thing here. Uh, let's say if you bring up the other chart to this uh, Russia, Russian immigration statistics. Uh, the, um, like the, you know, the white Russians are usually, you're talking about like the Tartar ethnic group who have like a below replacement fertility rate and very high death rate they're shrinking so to compensate for that and to sort of maintain population they keep bringing in uh, people from east asia and th they have at least when they're moving in there they're going to have a higher fertility rate so the russia has sort of kept their population this, uh, about the same size but like the, who is actually there changes right the muslim the percentage of muslim is just going up uh year by year and it doesn't seem to be reversing but yeah can you maybe zoom in a little bit more so we can take a look at this graph because it's interesting i mean you're seeing in the the, the light blue line is uh immigration and then the dark blue line is emigration and you see the bottom line there is net immigration so like net immigration is actually not that high i mean you're what thinking about the yeah. The United States, it would have been a lot higher, right? Because it's gone from, you know, like 100 million to 200 million to like 300 million people. Uh, the United States has a much higher net migration. But Russia is sort of, it, it's going up, but it's not that high because there's so many people leaving as well. And yeah. I don't have a complete breakdown over who is leaving Russia, Wouldn't but that like, mean that sort of the replacement factor is just even worse than in a sense. Yeah, it's, it, I, that's what I think too, because I suspect that a lot of, say, if you're like a young white Russian and you're you tech savvy and you've like you've been on the internet, it's very likely that you want to uh, travel abroad and study or something, or you want to go live somewhere else if you have like a visa. Um, so, but uh, I mean, this graph starts in the 1990s and it ends in the. 2020 so you don't see what's happening after that but uh, I'm, it's very likely that it's actually net migration has gone up even more because of the need uh is particularly created from like further expansion into ukraine 
when you have so much of um, yeah. so many resources tied up into the army then you need basically you need to absorb inflation you need construction a lot of it right because uh, if they when they take ukrainian territory they're going to have to rebuild it they've sort of blown a lot of it into bits and they want to sort of rebuild it into being kind of russian cities i think they they doing that with like mario pool now uh right and so so that is sort of the the motivation for why you need to keep the uh the engine running on it so like in in the 90s this is when the soviet union has collapsed so there's a high immigration and emigration from kind of like the the general soviet states where ethnic russians move back into russia and uh let's say like the ukrainians or something living in um living in russia or they're as Azerbaijanians, they move back into their own states so uh, this is what uh -huh. you're seeing like with uh, the world war ii as well like there's, there's a lot of like re re-migration of the native populations back into yeah, their yeah. home countries things sort of restabilizing uh, yeah and of course uh, among that restabilizing there's also a certain amount of central asians coming in to just be away from like ethnic conflict within those countries and from that period on it's, it's just kind of drops downwards you know um the 1990s was notoriously rough on russia i mean you can see videos on the the era of like the oligarch uh, the robber capitalists when uh, they try to liberalize the russian <laughs> yeah. policy which is essentially just bringing in some american jewish professors to help them sell uh, the the public economy to like jewish russian gangsters i mean it, it's essentially what happened uh, th this was like restructured by uh, Putin later, but like half of the oligarchs are still Jewish with Israeli citizenships. But I mean, that, that's another another discussion. It was a very bad time to be in Russia generally. And you're seeing it with the decrease in immigration. Uh, generally, it's because it really yeah, spikes in 2010. Yes. I mean, w what happens there is that they had an economic boom which is due to oil prices uh, rising ah, because of world right. events. Yeah. And, and and that is sort of, the, the Russian economy is very, I mean, they talked about this kind of uh, slogan they have. With the, it's a gas station mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, it's a, a gas attached, station with yeah. a nation attached to it, right? But I mean, it's a bit, uh, a bit cringe. No, no, but I do remember in Norway as well, sort of, the, um, you know, 2010 to 2013 was, you know, the golden years, right? <laughs> the, the, their economy uh, is... The, yeah, dependent on raw material exports, right? So it's uh, they they export corn and they export oil, and it was a very hot period for oil. So it caused an economic boom in Russia, and boom causes immigration because the economy is better. There's more jobs and opportunities. Interesting though, so, the net migration uh, was quite stable. Yes, uh, I mean it goes up, but it um, you have a lot of people moving out continuously as well. Yep. Uh, so because of the immigration, they're sort of uh, like the, Putin puts in a lot of laws to sort of streamline the immigration flow coming into the country. It's sort of, you know, there's a lot of undocumented stuff. So it's really more about trying to find good routines to make it uh, official that they can have passports and papers and be documented. Um, so in in uh, 2014, the, the, there's created an organization called the Eurasian Economic Union that allows free flow of immigration between russia belarus armenia kyrgyzstan and kazakhstan so you have like the borats basically coming freely uh, the the borats and the dan Bilsarians just um <laughs> reigning into the country <laughs> I, I mean uh let's see kazakhstan is mostly muslim uh yeah <laughs> we're running out of we're running out yeah, Peter, of uh <laughs> Peter Sayan. Uh, oh, we're, we're, running out of work, we're running out of working age adults. We ran yeah. out of working age adults in the <laughs> 1990s. Now, now we're we're running out of children. Um, so the uh, uh, Tim Miller I, says you're big Ukraine guys. Yes, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I mean, my personal position is that I went from kind of I reluctantly supported Russia in the beginning to uh, really supporting Ukraine. That's just my honest position on this currently. Uh, I, I don't know if I could go into explaining that, but it really has much more to do with uh, simply just being European and viewing it from that lens. In the beginning, I, sure. I was, I mean, we're coming out of the uh, COVID lockdown period and I was very 
very much not in the mood for jingoism at that point. I, I wanted to. I, I imagine this would have been a short conflict where uh, uh, you know Western elites would have be humiliated, say like similar to the Afghanistan yeah. uh, withdrawal or, or something like that. that. It would have been kind of yeah. short episode where the Western elites get humiliated, and it's a sort of like it, it's a possibility for kind of uh, change or a lack of faith in the system. But as this stuff has gone on, and, and as you're sort of seeing that this stuff, it's it's not going away. It's just continues to escalate. And uh, it's, I, I mean, we live in a neighboring country to the Ukraine. And I mean, you're seeing Russia basically now turning into a war machine where they're able to actually make their economy function. I mean, with warts and all, even though they're they're pulling in like Muslims east and west, but and but you know. They've gotten into this feedback loop now where Russia is actually growing their economy because oil prices and corn prices are going up. But those things are going up because the war is going on. So <laughs> I really I really don't like where this is going, where like you have a demilitarized Europe uh, that just have just removed all of their military. And now with the United States. Yeah, I'm, I think uh, that's a good way of putting it. I'm not as much pro Ukraine as I'm, you know, more pro EU in that sense. Right. With, with, uh, it's a sort of, uh, OK, um, at this Europe point, I would rather the Americans, Europe. you know, actually did something, uh, hypothetically speaking, and, <laughs> yeah. and we would stop pouring money into that like black hole, right? It's, because that's it's, essentially it's, what we're doing. We're just throwing missiles and resources into it, and and we're like uh, Norway is like one of Zelensky's like top top guys list or something for for the amount of money spent. Oh, oh yeah, uh, it, it, certainly. But I mean, it is a. If you if you are a country with a lot of money and a small military, that is a way that you you do uh, you do support that, right? It, it it sort of just makes sense. But I mean, the problem is that the kind of the the EU response is just getting worse. It's just okay, we're just sending random equipment into Ukraine, and they they have to be trained to use it. Whereas the the Russian military just seems to be getting better as time goes along. Like yeah, for enough. every day, it's like it seems like the Russians are advancing. Uh, and and the Ukraine uh, situation is getting worse. Uh, people are just kind of running out of ideas as to what Norman to do says, about this. Uh, yeah. Pro-European, rather, not pro-EU. I agree. Yeah, I mean, we can see it that, or you can see the EU as a, like the, the EU where it's going as a kind of proxy for a kind of pan-European union instead of uh, uh, an economic we, zone that we can squabble going, about yes. that. But yeah. this is a sort of the, the issue here, because uh, that I've become aware of that problem, that Europe just has no military. Uh, you be I become aware of the fact that popular sentiment in the United States, especially with Trump, is that they just don't give a shit about it. You know, uh, there's more and more people, even in the elites, the economic elites that are sort of just, okay, we're just going to go full isolationist and not give a shit about it, or people in our spheres that just actively support Russia. And with the, a lot of the information that you're getting here, that Russia is really not the kind of like based conservative power. It is just like this kind of, um, you know, Muslim... <laughs> yeah, perfect. Like, Look at my uh, foreign proxy war dog. I'm never getting those tax dollars back. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah. I, I see, I see the like the American self interest argument. I have no problem with that. But it's yeah, just yeah, that, no, like, I Russia... it. It's just you know, if Americans get to make a self interest argument, I should be allowed to make one too. Other than that, that, I'm quite neutral on Ukraine, to be honest. Mostly because I'm not very, I'm not an armchair general. Like I, I don't really like talking too much about things that i don't know anything about right now the, the thing is that it, that is happening there is that it russia is an expansionist power that's just how i'm seeing it and looking at this sort of whether it's the the uh, invasions like in georgia or, or other places where they go into central asia syria these kind of areas they are expanding in foreign policy and they're just you know throwing the the sink at doing expansion uh, and th they're basically doing it by just fueling it on more brown people into those areas. And what's going on, I mean, this is sort of cliche thing to say. And I don't want to use these terms genocide or anything like that because I think it's cringe. But you, you have basically have now this kind of large multicultural, the, you know, powerfully anti-Nazi or sort of like they're... they're I mean, that is the, the raison d'etre for, for this war, like from Putin yeah. himself, that they're anti-Nazi. And we're, we're, we're going into to this because that is like, it, it sounds like a kind of a joke, but Putin is like this internally as well. Uh, we can talk about Navalny, but like cracking down on people who are ethno-nationalist inside of Russia because he doesn't want people to stop the immigration flow, right? So like part of the reason, I mean, it's like Navalny, 
uh, he's a controversial figure, but he was originally like the leader of uh, a nationalist party that wanted to do Russia for Russians. And that's one of the reasons that Putin doesn't like him and put him in jail for uh. quote unquote extremist activity, right? Because he wanted ethno nationalism inside Russia and stopping the flow of Central Asian immigration. And like, it, and Putin put him in jail for being a Nazi in a sense. So just like trying to be based inside of Russia gets you just killed because you're, you're, uh, um, these words like just don't mean anything anymore yeah well, well to him i mean th it stops him from I, it makes sense doing, yeah it's doing stupid. empire yeah <laughs> yeah you, you can't play age of empires <laughs> if they're just going to do a no it a, makes sense yeah and, so so i'm seeing it that basically like you have an expansionist uh multicultural power that is, is sort of just basically massacring now the most ethnically homogeneous country i mean the uh, big question Europe, here right? the big question is is Russia going to stop with Ukraine, right? And um, I've sort of gone from thinking that they're definitely going to stop with Ukraine to being like, I'm actually not so sure, <laughs> right? No, no, well, the thing is that I, I, Putin, he sees the West basically as through the friend enemy distinction. And yeah. like, th there's nothing that the, you have, a, sorry, you just have a lot of Putin simps in these uh, spheres, but. It was just praise everything that he says, but my just watching his interactions, whether it's with Tucker or whether he the interviews where he, like he has phone calls with Macron, he will basically just say whatever. Like you cannot rely on him to just tell the truth. Uh, he was on the phone with like Emmanuel Macron talking about with, when they're on the border of the Ukraine before the invasion starts, talking about the military exercise, and Macron is trying to talk. Well, you're going to move back, right? And uh, I mean, you're going to stop. And he just basically says, "Yeah, we're just going to do a military exercise, and then we'll be." uh we'll move away from it he's just he's never telling the truth to any western leaders he's not you know it's not a guy who's possible to really argue with he apparently has his own goals with uh russian expansion and regime maintenance that and he's not really willing to discuss the terms of that in any honest mm -hmm. ways with western leaders uh i mean and you can say that like macron is cringe or whatever but like France has actually tried to extend a hand to russia through most of like the 2000s and uh with trade and various relations. So it's, it's a little bit weird, especially you'd think that Macron had built up a little bit more um, trust Before. in a sense yeah. to, um, to, with Putin that he'd be, at least be honest with his intentions, but he just hasn't been. You're not getting a straight answer out of him. You can't ask him difficult questions or anything. So uh, the question is, are you willing to take that risk if he says that he's not going to uh, you know, increase the size of Russia or try to take back yeah. previous yeah. Soviet states. Well, I mean, you could you could have a good relation with Russia and also improve your military. Right? You can do both at once. I think that's. I, fair. I think it would just be very naive to say that if he has said once that he wasn't going to do it. I think that after he, uh, yeah, that's annexed, what I mean. Um, you know, trust but verify. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and annexed Crimea, he said that he wasn't going to take more of Ukraine. Yeah. Right? So it, it's uh, yeah. it, it is just you know, yeah. For fifty American dollar dues, thank you so much. Uh, that's a big, big donation. It says from the Moscow Times: Moscow attack means more Tajiks will suffer for alleged actions of a minority. The real victims of this terrible event are all those innocent Tajiks, which will be bullied by Russians. And in parentheses, Norm Macdonald smiles. So this is something we we did actually mention in the post from. Uh, Russians with Attitude podcast that uh, um, people seem to not like this in Russia, but it's still happening in sort of the media. This line of you know think about all the backlash, etc. So I, Russia is very difficult for me to understand. I don't understand how like Russians just seem to be wired differently in the way they think, well, and it might they, be true uh, that that what. Um, Russians with attitudes say is that they're able to do this weird Soviet style double speak thing where, you know, all the news media are, are talking about how, you know, the real victims are the innocent Tajiks who will be bullied. Meanwhile, we're going to torture uh, the perpetrators to send a message, you know, subliminally, basically, that, uh, you know, sit down. Yeah, I, th I think so too. I mean, it's, it's probably their form of containment. Instead of doing the Elton John concert, we get the the torture show with Ivan and friends. Yes. So let's see. I, I think we sort of fell fell out a little bit of the uh, of the train here. But uh, th these are interesting questions uh, in they terms are. of what's going up. So, but I'm just going to finish my the, my bullet points here. So. Uh, 
like from the 2020s, uh, Putin has made it legal to have dual citizenship in Russia, right? So getting uh, Russian citizenship has never been easier uh, than it is at this point. And like, that's where a lot of these kind of mass immigration of the, uh, of the Tajiks came from, right? Because they were able to just get dual citizenship and just move into Russia and had huge inflows. Even though, I mean, you can't see it on these graphs because they end in 2020. But uh, I think we have like one of these tweets here. Uh, it says uh, Tajiki immigration 2022. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, it's, a, it's a guy who on it. Twitter who's linking to. It's in the private uh, chat yep, there. I have uh, it. So there's there's a Russian fellow who who tweets uh, an article, and you could read it with a translation. Or, yep, or just I have the article. The Do you want the article? No, just uh, just share the tweet there. Okay. Uh, I mean, people, you know, just in the interest of time, because we can't get into too many too many things. But it does confirm. It is like a sort of Russian newspaper that. Um, confirms what he says here gargantuan uh, 174,000 Tajiks acquired Russian citizenship in 2022 about 2% of its population my prediction of a large Tajik emergent minority in Russia remains on track uh, also uh, 45,000 Armenians uh, so I, I mean I've, I've seen some sort of Russians uh, comment that they believe that like 10 percent of uh, the Tajiki population have moved into Russia since this law was enacted right uh, we have some memes uh... <laughs> we're gonna have full-on Tajiki ghettos in Moscow by 2035 purely because of a hole in a border that nobody cared to fix and petty corruption tolerance diver and diversity are going to be the foundation of our strength so there you go that's the new Russia I guess yeah um so i mean but but this is not new as well i mean they've had previous incidents in russia with um they say like muslim terrorist situation you had like the chechen hostage situation with about 200 fatalities this was in the early 2000s then they had the uh beslan school shooting uh, with about 300 uh fatalities in 2004 and they had uh the, said, uh, i don't remember who it was in the chat, someone said that, you know, uh, Putin was radicalized by the best school shooting. Uh, yeah, no, that's why he's uh, hard on terrorists. Yeah, I think the uh, the Chechen stuff was even more dramatic, actually. Uh, I mean, Burkhard was the one who taught me about this. It's been interesting to look at. And there was uh, an episode on the St. Petersburg Metro in 2017. I mean, everything going on there was like war crime central, right? Yep. Uh, I I remember uh, a bunch of people from the Chechens coming to immigrating to Norway, like seeking asylum, and none of them were okay. Right? We're talking not just like weird. We're talking <laughs> like full on PTSD, right? Um, and like some fourteen year old. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was going to sit and talk a little bit about Navalny and the the Russian nationalism a bit but i've already i think i already covered it um so i, yeah, I think we have no, an article I, think on actually, Navalny, but I think you covered the the essentials yeah. uh, a couple of minutes ago all right well um that's a lot <laughs> and you're giving me a lot to think about uh it's a very interesting topic because it's really sort of putting uh, putting myself up against the wall and asking the hard questions right um whenever i'm confronted with these uh, these things like what do i actually believe what am i willing to stand behind um so it's very interesting uh let yeah, it, I anything just, you want to say before we leave no i think we're i think we're good i hope everybody has a good have a good easter and um yeah uh, and a good night yes uh of course as always Ludic path wants you to read paxarchy.com uh, very nice uh, collection of uh, uh, dissident writers. And you can follow us on Twitter, Ludic Path and a Walrus. Um, the links to my Twitter should be in the description. And uh, I think that's it for now. Uh, I don't have anything specifically planned for next week, so that's going to have to be a surprise, as they often are. And until then, we wish you a good weekend and a happy Easter.
Bye-bye, everyone.